the 1940s and 50s, the composer Giancarlo Menotti was internationally famous for his highly dramatic and popular operas such as The Medium and The Consul. His children's opera, Amal and the Night Visitors, is still performed all over the world at Christmas. And he became a cultural celebrity when he founded the Festival of Two Worlds in Spoleto in Italy in 1958. Menotti's passion for melody and simple human drama is now rather out of fashion, but his music is being kept alive at the Spoleto Festival today. In July 2000, Menotti reached the age of 89, but was busy as ever attending rehearsals and performances, as well as meeting the press. In recent years, he's handed over the running of the festival to his adopted son, Francis. The musical direction is now in the hands of Richard Hickox, who's undertaken to perform more of Menotti's orchestral music, as well as his operas. There's a lot of snobbishness about his music, particularly in England, because here in Italy, he is a god. And it's extraordinary that uh, so much of John Carlos' music was played so much in the 1950s, 60s and 70s and isn't heard now. And I love the man so much that I really want to put it back on the map. Meeting Giancarlo Menotti is like paying a visit to the entire 20th century of musical and artistic life. Stephen Spender, who helped me with the... An Italian who spent most of his career in America, he feels that it was fate that made him famous as a composer of operas. This was Charlie Chaplin. Wow. This is with Rosa Poncel. Yeah. This is what I looked when I first arrived in America. <laughs> <laughs> My whole life, really, I seem to do uh, certain things that I had not planned and with extraordinary results. Uh, to start with, I mean, I was lucky enough to be very, 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 uh, 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 to make the right choice uh, in a certain way, or the wrong choice, because it, it uh, made me an opera composer, and I never meant to, to, to write operas, because my teacher, was an Italian, but he was a, a pupil of Mandicevsky, the great friend of Brahms. And he was not interested in opera at all, uh, and I was very much influenced by him. So I, uh, all uh, during my studies, I did nothing but write motets and masses and, and, and uh, uh, symphonic pieces and so on, but, but never dreamt of writing an opera. Did you feel guilty once you started writing opera? in some way. Uh, yes, I thought I was disobeying my teacher <laughs> a little bit. Waiting. Waiting. The Consul is arguably Menotti's most enduring opera, an intensely dramatic account of a woman's struggle with bureaucracy in an authoritarian state.
Giancarlo Menotti, seen here on the left, was born in Italy in 1911, one of ten children. He displayed such talent when young that no less a person than the conductor Arturo Toscanini advised his mother to send Giancarlo to America for his musical education. Toscanini's uh, advice to my mother to take me out of Milan was a very wise move for my mother to follow. It took a great deal of courage because I was only 16 and uh, I stopped going to school and then uh, we... Uh, we took the boat to New York, and then she, she dumped me in Philadelphia, and I did not speak English. I've never been outside Milan much, and uh, it was, oh, everything was very different and new for me. But more than anything, for me it was a revelation musically, because all of a sudden, I mean, in Milan at that time, you know, Brahms was considered a very strange, boring composer and, and was never played, and Tchaikovsky was very little. And, and, and all of a sudden I found myself in Philadelphia with Tchaikovsky with a wonderful orchestra, a Philadelphia orchestra, playing all sorts of new music. And uh, then I met Samuel Barber, who, who had a lovely baritone voice, and. I never heard uh, Schubert songs or, or Schumann songs. I mean, they were unknown in Italy. Nobody had uh, a leader concert. And, uh, and for the first time, I heard all this music that I, I never heard before. It was such a, an extraordinary experience. Minotti studied at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia for six years alongside Samuel Barber, who became his close companion. But it was a trip they subsequently made to Europe that sparked Minotti's first interest in writing an opera. When uh, I finished my studies at the Curtis Institute, I said, wouldn't you like to go to Vienna for a year? And in Vienna we found a, an apartment in Bramsplatz. I remember Bramsplatz Fier. And it belonged to a... To a, um, a Baroness von, von Motychewski. She was enormous, en absolutely enormous. She rented us the, the second floor of, the, of her apartment. And, um, and she took a liking uh, to me, and, and she, she always invited me to come to see her uh, around six, seven o'clock in the evening. She always stayed in bed. She was too fat to walk around. <laughs> she used to be a very, uh, a very beautiful girl. Uh, thin, and she'd always told, uh, uh, talk to me about, about the balls she used to go when she was a young girl. And she had in her uh, room, she had a, 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 a toilet uh, with, a, with a mirror and lots of perfumes and so on that she used to use, especially when she when used to go to, to, to balls. And I don't know, it was a ball made of... Uh, it was a uh, very Viennese, uh, uh, very sh a sh a sugary table, <laughs> uh, very pink and, and blue. And, and, uh, and somehow uh, that table uh, suddenly put some music into, into my head. And, uh, uh, and she told me how naughty she was at the time and so on. And uh, so... Um, when I was asked by, by my school to write uh, something for their 25th anniversary by, by the Curtis Institute of Music, uh, I decided to write Amelia Goes to the Ball. <laughs> Amelia Goes to the Ball was eventually staged at the Metropolitan Opera to huge acclaim. But in Italy, it was a different story. I received a cable from Rome from the Minister of Culture in the fascist uh, government. And, uh, and I was asked to come to Italy um, and to come to Rome. They wanted to talk to me. And uh, so when I went back to, uh, to Italy, uh, I went to Rome. Uh, and I met with the, with the uh, Minister of Culture of, of, under Mussolini, 
and told me, he said, uh, well, I, uh, we hear, we read in the paper that you had an opera at the Metropolitan. And it was extraordinary for a young Italian like that. And uh, we would like to present your opera La Scala here. And uh, I said, well, thank you very much. And then he said, um, however, and then he took the lapel of my coat and put the fingers there. And I said, ah, you want me to have to join the party? He said, I'm sorry, I will not. So then, then you, will, you will not have your opera at a scale. I said, well, too bad. And that, that was my end. When finally the opera was given then in a little theater in, uh, with a small theater in Italy, the press was horrible. It was given together with an opera by a fascist composer. And of course, he got marvelous reviews. And, although the opposite now it's completely forgotten. And the media, I must say, uh, uh, I think I've, I've written better operas than that, at least I hope so. Um, Barber always used to tease me and always say, oh, you know, you know, the only good opera you ever wrote was Amelia <laughs> Menotti's real fame began in New York in 1947 with the successful run of The Medium in a Broadway theatre. The opera tells the story of a phony medium who becomes convinced the spirit world is real and takes out her fears on a deaf mute boy in her charge with fatal results. <laughs> Something you've evolved very clearly, I think, well, especially in the medium, but also all the way through all of all the rest of your operas, um, is a, a style which is really very uniquely your own, which is partly there is speech, just straight speech, then there is speech in rhythm, then there is song, which is in a kind of a speech-based rhythm, and then there is full, should we say, aria-type singing as well. How did you come to that kind of mixture of those... Well, that is where, where, you know, very often they say that uh, my, my, my uh, uh, in greater influence is Puccini. I don't think my music sounds like Puccini at all. That it's, um, uh, but I have learned, uh, uh, but the technique of Puccini has influenced me a great deal because Puccini is but one of the uh, perhaps the only composer who has been able to write a, a completely melodic recitativo. He, he is, uh, his arias are not arias. It always tells, tells a story, and, and especially in Bohème. And I can see why Stravinsky was uh, very moved by it, because uh, it, uh, Puccini has been able, in Bohème, uh, not, not in the other operas, what, uh, almost uh, also in, in Tosca, but in Bohem especially. You can really sing Bohem from, from the first measure until the, the last measure. You can sing the whole opera and sing the whole story uh, with a melodic flow that is really astonishing. My theory was that as long as music exists, opera will live because men sang on the stage before I spoke. And I thought that opera should come back to, to uh, 
to a um, to the present times and and and, and the way that that Verdi, Puccini, Wagner use the theater of their own time, to which we use also the theater of our own time, and, and which is a, a theater that has been uh, it's an intimate theater, very much influenced by Chekhov and and uh, and uh, uh, Pirandello and so on. Uh, who, who are uh, authors that probably would never have thought of writing a, a, a libretto for a, for a composer. But I thought that I could uh, uh, write my own librettos and then present the operas not in those uh, gilded uh, caverns called opera houses where people uh, see uh, uh, the, the singers uh, miles away, but when you were uh, having the ideas of, of, of taking the medium and putting it in a, in a smallish Broadway theatre, I mean, that was 1946. You, must have, you were very ahead of your time talking about singers, A, who can act, and B, who look like the roles they're portraying. Because opera hasn't, has only really caught up with that idea in the last 20 years or so. Well, it was, it actually did, it uh, revolutionised the, the, the uh, world of opera at that time, especially in America. And uh, so many composers were never uh, thought of writing operas, uh, decided uh, uh, not only, um, uh, even more af after the success of the council, but people who came to, to hear my operas then and then decided to write operas were uh, Stravinsky, Poulenc, Samuel Bob, uh, Copeland, uh, uh, heavens, I mean, uh, I don't remember them all, but they all, and many of them asked, asked me to write a libretto for them. Poulenc, for example, and, uh, and then Barber, and of course I did that. But, uh, uh, but it was really, uh, it, it, uh, it suddenly, uh, at that time, opera was very unfashionable. Among, uh, and all of a sudden, everybody wanted to write opera. Ein Bitaton Kerkestra. Ma che orchestra, il dottore al pianoforte, il sindaco al violino. As well as staging the operas of other composers, Menotti has regularly directed productions of his own works and is seen here in Spoleto in 1978, rehearsing Maria Golovin. Perché devi per forza? The opera tells the story of the jealous love of a blind man for an older married woman. Uh, during, the, uh, I like, during this time, I would like, don't just stand, uh, st you know, just, uh, you're beginning to have, uh, here we're having another mm. scene. Don't, don't just, don't stand yes. still, yeah. Uh, perché devi per forza, let's do it from there. Perché devi per forza. In the past, when you've written a new opera, you've written the text, you've written the music, and then you've directed the first production. Um, that's a tremendous amount of control over a new piece of work. Do you think that kind of control has been important to you? Um, well, yes, because... Um, do you know what, uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, um, keeps me very often from going to the opera nowadays is that uh, I would say that uh, Practically all of the young stage director, they don't, they don't illustrate uh, the music. Uh, they only read the libretto, listen to the music, but the music has its own language, and uh, and it illustrates a for the composer a certain action. So when I go and I see a, a staging where the music says, move, and everybody's there uh, standing still. And then the, the music says, please stand still now, just sing. And then you see people running all around the stage. I get absolutely frantic. I say, for God's sake, listen to the music. How can you, uh, if you sing uh, Ritorna Vincitor, you have to walk with that music because uh, the music says so. I uh, you don't have to ask Verdi for that. The music says it. And, uh, and then you have some, some big fat singers standing still and uh, belting out the phrase without moving. And that, uh, 
and uh, and when I write my my operas, I um, I start singing it, and as I as I, as I uh, write the, the the words, and I see exactly exactly how people should move at at that moment. Now I don't I expect the and a stage director to to guess what kind of movement, uh, but uh, at least I would like to have uh, to see what what how he interprets my music, the movement of my music. But the but but certain movements has to have to be respected. <laughs> Ti avranno dei doni per te, e Dio niente, perché non me l'hai detto. Non farne un mio, madonato. Yeah, but, 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 sì, do, 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 don't come here, go back, and don't wait on the chair. Uh, Do you think, when has it made you feel that, as a composer, you should be ever more prescriptive about everything that you mean, every intent, every gesture, so that there's no room for any doubt? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because people don't don't bother. I mean, there are certain moments. Just now, I I'm, uh, I was rather <coughs> uh, touched because uh, the the uh, the director of the uh, Deutsche Oper in in in, uh, in Germany is retiring, and for his last. Uh, uh, staging has chosen Amalia the Night Visitors. And he wrote me a, le a letter and uh, asked him whether I would have something with it is too short for, for the whole evening. And he wanted me. And so I'm writing to him. I said, please, if you stay Jamal, I don't care what you do with it. But there are, at this moment, I want Amal to, to fall into in the arm of its mother. In this moment, I want. Uh, and uh, there are about three moments, at least those three, I don't care what you do with it, uh, but please don't f miss those, those three. I'm, I'm curious to know what it is going to write back. <laughs> Hurry back and see who it is, and don't you dare make up tales. A children's Christmas story, Amal and the Night Visitors, was the first ever opera commissioned by television and for two decades was the most performed opera in America. Martha, 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 come with me. If I tell you the truth, I know you won't believe me. Try it for a change. But you won't believe I'll me. I'll believe you if you tell me the truth. Surely, love, there are not two kings outside. That is surprising. The kings are three, and one of them is black. <laughs> Why is it that, that you've written so many pieces which have a religious context, like the Saint of Bleecker Street, for instance? First of all, because there's a child that was very religious. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, when I was, I think, two or three years old, I guess, I, uh, I, uh, I was lame. I had some trouble with one of my legs. And, uh, and I was taken to a miraculous Madonna, and uh, I was given the blessing, and I walked. And that, of course, it comes back in Amal and the night visitors. And, uh, and then I had many, many uh, uh, experiences in my life that uh, uh, that drive me back in, into a, a, the search for God. Uh, and, and I think that faith is a, is a wonderful gift if you have it. I, I'd, uh, 
uh, and it is a struggle, a struggle you know, that that uh, and that is very important. And, and that's why they said the Saint Oblique Street is probably the opera that that I, I like most that I've written. And in in that I made the principal characters uh, brothers and sister because. I think that faith and doubt are always together. You cannot have one without the other. But they fight. There is no way that they can understand each other. How instinctive are you as a composer? I mean, how much of it is head and how much heart? <laughs> you know, my teacher uh, taught me something that it, it, uh, it wanted something even more than that. He always said, the music is not only your head, it's not only your heart, it's your whole body. You must breathe with music. You must, uh, uh, you must take in your breath and out and you, you must lift one leg and then put it down, and then it will walk. But there's so much modern music, you know, used to say, uh, the, the, the composer moves around and kicks at them, but that doesn't walk. So they, and, uh, and you have really to, to, to use your whole body in your music. And you do pace around when you're composing, don't you? I try to, but it's very difficult to pace around, you see, because... Uh, You've got space for it. <laughs> <laughs> because to walk, to, to walk, music to walk real around must have a very strong bass line. And uh, my music, if there is a... God only knows that too many faults in my music. But one, one that uh, Sam Barber also used to, to scold me about it. Your basses are lazy. Why don't you work on your bass line? It, 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 and yes, I'm, 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 uh, I try, I try, you know, I, the only thing that interests me now in my old age is to learn things. As Solzhenitsyn said, uh, Stupid people like to teach, uh, and intelligent people uh, like to learn. And I'm still learning, I must say. I, and uh, uh, and say, so I, uh, I am, uh, I'm trying to, to, um, to steal from Bach his, uh, his monstrous uh, talent and the way he moves his his, uh, his bass lines. I mean. <laughs> but in a purely orchestral piece, you find yourself singing the the lines. Yes, I also yes yes because I think that uh, music uh, the, the 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 human uh, uh, breathing uh, is is uh, always felt in in all in beautiful music.
Is that why you've always felt an antipathy towards, well, the Schoenberg School and the music of the avant-garde composers post-Second War, where melody is almost like the least important thing, the least important element? But you see, I, I while we, we go into a very dangerous uh, aesthetic field, uh, Yes, I, I feel that that, that uh, I feel that, that, that the composer um, doesn't invent anything. Uh, he, he, he received from God uh, a gift, and uh, um, and he has to. Uh, a, a gift is, is what we call inspiration. What is inspiration? Is that uh, the composer has a very fleeting vision of an aesthetic truth, and then he has, he has uh, uh, tried. Uh, then, then he has to try to remember what, what he has seen, and uh, and that is very hard work. He must prepare himself for that gift that God gives you. Sometimes, sometimes he never uh, gives it to you. Uh, it is, uh, uh, there are some composers that only re have received their gift once uh, or twice in their whole life. Then there are composers like Mozart, like Schubert, like Beethoven, who, are com uh, who, are, who have been blessed by, by this gift. But that is what is very important to me in music, is what I call the... Uh, uh, the inevitability of music. To me, great music must be inevitable. It's, it's already there. It's not that you invent it. You find it. It's something that you find. And, 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 and when you find it, you know it. It is a wonderful moment. And, and, uh, uh, but, uh, but we must be very humble because uh, God either gives you the gift or or if, if he gets angry with you, take, he takes it away. There are composers like, like, like Rossini, like uh, Brahms, that went, what, years and years without write, being able to write anything because they knew that, that there's no use writing something that, is, uh, that uh, doesn't have that, that gift. And that gift is, we, we, that's not called, yes, it's melody. It, it's, uh, it's a theme, a great theme. And, and that, that great theme, uh, you feel it in your own body, in your whole, that, that, that you have found something that is, is, uh, is an aesthetic truth. Do you think when Schoenberg discovered, as it were, his 12-tone technique, do you, do you think he not saw that as an aesthetic truth? Well, he, of course, he, he must have... Uh, uh, he, he, he must have uh, uh, believed in that, otherwise he wouldn't have uh, not done it. But I don't think that that he did. I think, I think and I I feel that that the twelve tone music is already dying now, and 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 will be soon be dead. <gasps> am, am I being shot? <laughs> Anybody shooting me? <laughs> Since 1958, the Spoleto Festival has taken place every July, coinciding with Menotti's birthday, which is celebrated in grand style by the local citizens. The festival quickly became a highly fashionable event and has retained its position in the European cultural calendar for 43 years. Well, Spoleto has been an enormous part of your life. It's had its ups, it's had its downs. Obviously, you have some regrets about having started it, but what do you think your legacy is to Spoleto and what 
role do you think Spoleto is going to continue to play in the cycle of world festivals, should we say? Well, I, I, I've said it again and again, and, uh, uh, and I also try to make you my son, who now has taken over the reins of the festival, and uh, I already go there more as, a, as part of the audience than anything else. But the, as I said before, I, I suffer from, from many uh, guilt com complexes. And one of that is that of the, of the, uh, 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 it's, it's, it's my, my conviction that, that the role of the artist in society is, has become uh, false. The now, Sam Baba used to say, we are nothing but the after dinner mint of society. Well, I, I wanted to prove to myself and to the world, possibly, that the role of the artist can be the very bread of society, that the artist in a community can be as important as any other, as the doctor, as the... Uh, Firemen, or that that he can be not only a cultural uh, entity, but even an economic one. And then, uh, important was that so many artists felt that same need of being needed that that was so strong in me. And curiously enough, to my surprise, so many people. Uh, said, oh, of course we come to help you. And one of them was uh, Lucchino Visconti, uh, went to Henry Moore, and uh, when they decided to do the poets, I went to Ezra Pound, and uh, I went to uh, Jerome Robbins. All the artists, all of them really, all said, yes, we'll come, and we don't want to be paid. <laughs> And they all love the idea of, of being needed, of, uh, have the dignity of being the heroes of the town. One of the regular events of the festival has been the outdoor performances in the Piazza del Duomo of great choral works such as Haydn's The Creation. The festival orchestra and chorus have always been largely composed of young American musicians. So you have a fantastic cultural exchange there because you have all these Americans coming to play in the festival orchestra, often to sing in the choir, perhaps to perform in the operas. So there is a real exchange of, of culture. When we started the festival, it was a bomb in, in Italy because, first of all, uh, we presented almost everything in the, uh, in the orchestra and, and the singers and... Uh, they were all very young. I mean, uh, uh, Shippers was only about 24, 25, something like that. And, and um, all the singers that I had in Bohem and I had in, uh, also when we did, uh, when, when Visconti did the Macbeth, they were all with very young singers. Now young singers are everywhere, but at that time, I mean, that uh, uh, nobody dared uh, in the, in the big theater to have a, a young singer who had, never, had no experience and so on. But uh, we started the right way and, and people that we discovered, I mean, we all, imagine that, that we had concerts every day with, uh, with uh, Yo-Yo Ma, with Jacqueline Dupre, 
uh, with uh, with uh, um, uh, Zuckerman P- Peraya. With, I mean, with, with great uh, people. We had uh, a young singer called uh, Rene Fleming, who, who nobody had ever heard of. Uh, I mean, great talent like that, and we, we go on discovering people like that again and again and again in, in the dance, and uh, uh, and then all of, a, all of a sudden, the whole of Italy began thinking, well, why don't we do the same thing? All about all, why must, must Poleto have all these wonderful talents? And, and, uh, <clears throat> and that was really the, uh, also, I was the first one to, to, uh, to ask uh, stage directors from films and so on to come and, and stage opera. And, uh, and also, I insist on the physique du role. I, I did not have operas with big, fat uh, sopranos, uh, uh, you know. Dying of consumption. That, that just, just would never happen in Spoleto. What makes our audience different from audiences in other festivals is that they are called to come to discover, to create, not to applaud uh, famous people, but they are coming to make them famous. In 1973, Menotti moved from America to Scotland, where he took up residence in a mansion called Yester House, just outside Edinburgh. Here, he's often joined by his adopted son and grandchildren and remains busy editing his past works, as well as creating new ones. He's promised to write another piano concerto for Jean-Yves Thibaudet, the pianist. He's done sketches for it. Uh, he, he starts working on it, then he goes away from it, because he, he, uh, he gets um, uh, really carried away, and he, he, he gets the heart pains, the angina, when he's, he's composing, and it, it frightens him a bit. So he. He goes off it. I'm, I'm sad about that. Right? But I hope he'll be able to, to finish the piece. Which would you say of all your pieces is the one where you've most successfully been yourself? <laughs> oh, God. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, I think I've been a very lazy composer. I've had... I, I'm very sad if I have anything that, that saddens my old age is that I, I should not have started a festival. And that, uh, uh, that is, uh, it, it's taken so much of my time and uh, uh, I wanted to, I want to prove, um, unfortunately I'm not only a musician, I, I write, I, I read a great deal of philosophy. I have my own. Uh, I have uh, many guilt complexes, and uh, 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 I have a struggle with faith. And, and uh, um, so uh, it's it's. Uh, uh, so that's why I started um, the festival because I, um, I want to prove that uh, the importance of the artist in in a. In, uh, in, a, in a social context and so on. But, but uh, 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 I don't know whether God has given me the gift. Maybe he, uh, a little bit maybe, I don't know. I think I, think I, I wasted an awful lot of, of time uh, doing other things probably and that I should not have done. 
and also um, and not falling in love all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, oh, terribly no, distracting. No, uh, very distracting, and it's a big loss of time, I must say. Also, you've and now, now that I, I uh, don't fall in love anymore because I can't anyway. And uh, now I, uh, I don't think that uh, I think I think that uh, God refuses to give me the gift again, if, if I ever did. Uh, now that I'm at peace with myself. I, well, sometimes I keep asking God, please give me another chance, give me another chance. And, uh, but when you are, when you are 90 years old, what sort of chance can you ask for? <laughs>